Hello, everyone. Welcome to our symposium, Hidden Stories, Global History, Local Networks. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I know we have a very global audience today and tomorrow, and I am very excited. Uh, my name is Phyllis Chakar Philip. I am founding creator of Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, and I am thrilled to have you all here today uh, with us. Uh, I will be giving an um, overview about our collection because I think not everyone knows uh, what, uh, what is the collection of uh, Aga Khan Museum. And I will be starting with it and uh, it, hope you can enjoy it. Every bibliophile and connoisseur knows the feeling of turning the very first pages of a book. The way these pages stimulate the senses through their smell and the rustling of, paper, of the paper foreshadowing the delights of discoveries to come. Prince Sadreddin Aga Khan, whose personal art collection forms the core of what constitutes the Aga Khan Museum collection today, may well have experienced such sensation when as a child he made his first acquaintance with Islamic manuscripts in uh, France, while spending time there with his parents. In, uh, in France, he, uh, in the library of Villa, he recalled coming, coming across a great Mamluk Quran manuscript from the 14th century. Its pages open to the Surah Al-Nas, uh, a chapter frequently recited by his father, and which is one of the surahs offering apotrophic protection. Although Prince Sadreddin was not able to read the holy text at the time, he would later recount how fascinated he was by the manuscripts, powerful calligraphy and illuminations. He described it, uh, it as a mystical experience and feeling that would be with him throughout his lifetime as an art connoisseur and collector. Prince Sadreddin Aga Khan's extraordinary uh, passion for Islamic manuscripts and related art, artworks matched that of early Muslim societies, where the art of the book held much esteem. His passion was ignited by libraries of Iranian culture established by his grandmother. One was in Mumbai and the other in Pune presumably in the famous Aga Khan Palace built in 1892. Her libraries focused on Iranian culture, philosophy, faith, and science, as well as mystical texts, a blueprint of, of the Aga Khan Museum collection today. The Aga Khan family's prestigious collection of 1,250 artworks is housed in the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, designed by the Pritzer prize-winning Japanese architect Fuhimiko Maki. Its founder and pa patron is His Highness Prince Karim Aga Khan, who shares his uncle's passion for handwritten and illuminated manuscripts and is a great art connoisseur and philanthropist in his own right. Not surprisingly, the Aga Khan Museum collection is especially strong in the arts of the book and particularly, particularly Iranian manuscripts such as the Shahnameh or Book of Kings, Iranian national epic. Miniature paintings and drawings following. Another important aspect uh, of Aga Khan Museum collection involves Indian uh, and especially Mughal paintings that speak of symbiosis of Muslim and non-Muslim artists at court, a sign of pluralism. The prayer book that you see in the slide, Bay Marks of Benefits, originally composed 15th century Morocco, was frequently copied from Senegal to Turkestan. It was the most popular devotional work along the Silk Roads, second only to the Quran. While it does not state where and when it was made, this copy can be confidently attributed to Kashmir in Northern India based on the illumination marking the book divisions and the inclusion of the Bothe motif featured on Kashmiri textiles. This manuscript is the opening artwork of the exhibition, Hidden Stories, book along the, Books Along the Silk Roads. Remarkably, a large proportion of the artworks in the Aga Khan Museum collection bear inscriptions referring to the artist of the paintings, the calligrapher, or the illuminator. 
In this way, they provide evidence of individuality of artists, as well as the respect and acknowledgement they command, co commanded through their uh, creations. The miniature painting, Learned Man, in the intimate scene of reading a book is the focus of the single page uh, drawing. It is executed in the half pan Persian nim kalem technique developed in the 16th century, which is related to European grisé, a method of painting or drawing in gray monochrome that was used to imitate, imitate sculpture and engravings. Basavan, a renowned Hindu artist at Akbar's court and the artist of this drawing reinvented the Western techniques he encountered through the European books and prints brought by Christian missionaries to India. The drawing is on display in the exhibition as an example of these kind of artistic exchanges. The museum's manuscripts and paintings are also historically significant, for they include portraits representing individual Mughal rulers and provide valuable historical information about their world view. The next painting, what I'm going to talk is Persian, Indian, European forms converge in stunning painting of the Alexander the Great, seated in a pose that resembles that of a Mughal ruler. Iskandar wears a helmet um, en engraved with the image of a horse that echoes the prancing animals at the upper right. The helmet's Italian Al Antica style both signals the adoption of European motifs in Mughal India and participate a revival of shared classical past epitomized by Alexander. I will not go further into this painting as Susanna delivered a phenomenal lecture on Alexander the Great with a focus on this painting available on the museum's YouTube channel and on the website of digital exhibition that is hosted generously by University of Toronto. Throughout the Muslim world, the creation of royal workshops was an important impetus for the connoisseurship of art. Sovereigns, princes, and other members of ruling classes uh, act as patrons of artists and connoisseurs of the art they commissioned and collected. The art of the book was of primar primary interest in this respect and often led to the establishment of excellent libraries. In turn, the country courtly manuscripts and albums kept in these royal libraries provided a continuing source of inspiration for artists of later generations. Often exclusively illustrated manuscripts also functioned as diplomatic and ceremonial gifts, gifts between courts, as they represented both the excellent taste of the connoisseur and the wealth and power of the patron, who through the artist he employed uh, expressed his own artistic vision and worldview. Patrons and connoisseurs likely had an influence on the development of historically significant artistic hubs, whether the Herat, Tabriz, Agra, or Istanbul. However, these aspects of Islamic art should be viewed from a global perspective. And that is what initiated our coll collaboration with BSR. Our collaboration began in 2017 with a grant application which we partnered on was successful. I then received the information from Alexandra Gillespie that the research group Books and the Silk Roads would start working at the University of Toronto. Bitten by the book bug, we have since utilized every possible opportunity to work together. We hosted members of the group at our museum, shared our collection, we partnered in inviting international scholars, among others, Karin Schaper, conservator of the Rare Books Library of Leiden University in the, in the Netherlands, who did a survey on our manuscript collection and delivered a lecture on Islamic book bindings hosted by BSR. When COVID-19 hit the entire world in March 2020, I was having one of my first Zoom meetings with Alex, who had just finished examining a Kashmiri manuscript in the Thomas Rare, Fisher Rare Library. I find myself her, uh, telling her about some Kashmiri manuscripts in our collection and proposing that we should do something together. And today, 
you are witnessing and participating in uh, where this conversation took us. At this point, I want to take the opportunity to thank Alexandra Gillespie, who team teamed me up with Dr. Suzanne Akbari, my co-curator and the entire BS Art, BSR team, and supported our endeavor enormously while leading the Toronto-based research team whose cutting edge work made this exhibition possible. The Kashmiri manuscript, which Alex was referring to, has played a significant role in our collaboration and the development of our uh, exhibition concept. From day one, it was important for us uh, as team to conceptualize the exhibition together and uh, with a global approach. Because 21st century museology requires a different approach, more diversity, inclusivity, and respect of equality. Collections are studied, researched, and visited more frequently, frequently with the lens of, of globalism. And we have, a cho we have chosen a non-colonial and non-Western approach to respectfully represent all cultures along the Silk Roads. The collaboration between BSR and the museum pivoted around the production of, of book and manuscripts along the Silk Roads, including the used materials and technologies, creating awareness around uh, this research in the context of globalism and intercultural crossroads for the general public. Although the focus of the exhibition is on, the, on manuscripts and tradition of book production, we have included diverse materials to explore interlinked relationships through materiality, as well as the strong relationship between written and oral traditions. Considering the romanticized name Silk Road, we could not help but wanting to include silk robes to emphasize the importance of production of silk throughout the vast geographical coverage of the, these roads and silk's connection to, the, to manuscript production. Sometimes the fabrics were used uh, as book bindings or the manuscripts were wrapped in textile for protection, which was one of the topic of the last year workshop of BSR. The portability of the, both textiles and manuscripts was another aspect we included in our concept. Generally, you, re, uh, you read stories in the books, but sometimes they can be embroidered on textiles as well. As an example, you can see four different stories embroidered on a 20th century Central Asian robe from the Aga Khan Museum collection. This luxurious robe made of wool, um, woven, felted, and embroidered, tells four different stories. It shows the court of wise King Solomon, illustrating his marvelous ability to understand the languages of all creatures, followed by uh, that of Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Rashid, offering a ninth century model for exemplary rule. Featured in the Thousand One Night Tales, Harun Rashid founded the Grand Library, which is called House of Wisdom in Baghdad, and exchange gifts with the European ruler Charlemagne, including silk, ivory, and elephant named Abu Abbas. I am mentioning this for Adam, who a couple years ago delivered a remarkable lecture in the auditorium at Aga Khan Museum. Other stories featured on the robe include the Greek romance of Bamek and Azra, translated into Farsi in pre-Islamic times, and the story of Sultan Sanjar and the old woman from the Treasury of Secrets, from the first of five parts of Nizami's Hamse, which concerns religion, morality, and power. The images woven, uh, woven into this rope shows how textiles, almost as much as books, serve to carry many stories along the Silk Roads. This brings me to my summarizing point. The interdisciplinary work that uh, the hidden stories, books along the Silk Roads, explore and exhibit. Through the cutting edge scholarship of BSR, we were connected with an incredible network of scholars, historians, art historians, cur curators, linguists, conservators, papermakers, and bookbinders. This list can go on, and you are part of it. 
I want to emphasize how thrilled I am that, that we are all together today. I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart, Dr. Susanna Conkling Akbari, my co-creator and organizer of this symposium, and Melissa Martin, project manager of the exhibition and of this symposium. You all have contributed enormously to setting the content and format of this symposium. I recall having Zoom meetings with each group during the holidays, between us baking for our families, preparing for celebration, or sending out holiday cards to our beloved ones. I would especially like to thank the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton for making this virtual symposium accessible globally and for facilitating these two days at the highest level of professionality as well as the sponsors of the symposium in partnership with the Book and the Silk Roads Project, the Institute of Islamic Studies, and the Robert Ho Family Foundation, Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Toronto. Thank you very much. I now uh, hand over Dr. Suzanne Conkling Akbari. Thank you so much, Phyllis. That was a beautiful way to open our two days together. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to follow my friend and co-curator, Phyllis Shakir Philip, and to share with her the opening panel of this symposium, Hidden Stories, Global History, Local Networks. The symposium, like the exhibition itself, is the product of a rich network of researchers and museum staff, some based in Toronto and, as Phyllis has shown, in other parts of the world. Among these, I want to particularly thank Dr. Melissa Morton, who was the project manager for the Hidden Stories exhibition and who is the main organizer for the symposium today and tomorrow. It's not too much to say that without Melissa, we could not have achieved our goals. Her intellectual curiosity and expertise, along with her organizational skills and creativity, have in large measure brought us here today. In the next 20 minutes, I'd like to both look back and to look forward to look back in the sense that I'd like to tell the story of how this exhibition developed over time and look forward in the sense that I'd like to highlight what we have learned and to comment on what new things seem possible to us now. What questions do we have that we couldn't even have imagined when we began? What things did we leave out? What possibilities are now visible and what future directions might we take? Our four roundtables, two today and two tomorrow, along with a closing session to reflect on those roundtables, will provide us with much food for thought and I hope generate new initiatives regarding how we might carry out the study of pre-modern history, especially in the context of public outreach and the very special role of the museum. I'll tell the story of our work on the museum, focusing especially on the productive tension of the global and the local, and say a bit about how we chose the topics for the four roundtables that will follow. Let me first begin with how we conceived the exhibition. Our old books new science research group at the University of Toronto, led by Alexandra Gillespie, had long been hoping to find a way to more deeply connect our Book in the Silk Roads research project to our colleagues at the Aga Khan Museum. We'd already begun, as Phyllis has described, to build relationships with the museum, along with relationships with other cultural heritage institutions in the area, especially the Art Gallery of Ontario, in connection with a U of T-based initiative on Ethiopic studies, and U of T's own Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. It was clear, though, that the Aga Khan Museum would be a very special partner due to our shared interest in a global approach to the interconnected pre-modern past, especially with regard to the history of the book. When the pandemic began in the first months of 2020, international loans were suddenly put on hold. And museums were in the position of reconfiguring their exhibition plans for the foreseeable future. This provided an opportunity for us. And together with our main partner, Philly Chakir Philip, we wrote a proposal for an exhibition that would be at once local and global. Global in terms of the geographical diversity of the objects assembled there, but local in that all of the objects were currently housed in collections in Southern Ontario. We proposed to tell the story of the interconnected pre-modern past, using the history of the book as our pathway, revealing the hidden stories that each object tells. The idea of the Silk Roads gave us a way to connect to a wider public, using a familiar phrase and building on it. We would address not only the historical Silk Roads, the routes of trade and exchange that had linked East Asia and Europe for hundreds of years, but also the metaphorical Silk Roads, that is, the wider currents that cross both land and sea to connect people, objects, craft practices, and ideas. We began planning the exhibition by identifying some key terms that we knew we'd like to include, focusing particularly on manuscript books, but also adding objects that illuminate the craft practices of the same time and place. 
textiles, carpets, book stands, jewel-like amulets that enclose a tiny book or written page. As our selection for the Hidden Stories exhibition continued to grow, we began to organize the objects within different thematic strands. For example, the book and the body or intellectual, uh, intercultural crossroads and to explore juxtapositions of paired objects from different traditions. For example, here we see a manuscript of the Masoretic text of the Bible from Spain, written in Hebrew, side by side with a Quran anthology from China, written in Arabic in a style that mixes Islamic and East Asian calligraphic traditions. In these paired objects, we see the mingling of word and image in two different traditions, one from Iberia, one from East Asia, Far West and Far East, in a kind of fusion. Although we can read the words on the page, we're simultaneously awed by their abstract forms. Another juxtaposition brings together two objects that are almost about a thousand years old, position, positioned near the beginning of the exhibition. That is pages from the Mishnah or oral Torah preserved in the Cairo Geniza, seen at right, and a prayer sheet depicting Avalokiteshvara, a form of the Buddha, preserved in the library cave at Dunhuang, seen at left. This pair of objects, one from the Mediterranean region, the other from Central Asia, one handwritten, one printed, gives a sense of the exhibition as a whole. Through these suggestive pairings, we could encourage the objects to, as it were, speak for themselves. Once we began the actual physical installation of the exhibition, we began to joke that we could hear the books whispering to one another when the lights were down. The pairings were just one of the ways that we developed an internal structure of the exhibition. We also devised clusters that would illustrate the connections of diverse cultures, drawing on the different forms of the book, scroll, codex, or palm leaf manuscript, to demonstrate the range of craft practices and materials used along the Silk Roads. These included the sections you see here. Following an introduction, we moved into the making of books and then gathering around the book, um, section four, the book and the body, and finally, intercultural crossroads. Once we started to actually put the objects in place, however, we began to see, by which I mean virtually put them in place in our planning, uh, uh, planning document, we began to see new constellations, new configurations that would reveal different hidden stories. These secondary sub-themes that you see in the parentheses reflect the development of our thinking and shaping of the exhibition as it changed over the late summer months. Working with our wonderful designer, Christine Elson, Fizz and I would talk through different possibilities, often joined by other team members, and the section themes sometimes shifted in response to those conversations. We joked that putting the objects in the virtual exhibition space was like decorating a doll's house, working on this digital microcosm of what would become an in-person, full-scale exhibition. More seriously, though, the ability to work online through Zoom using shared documents and image files was absolutely crucial. The pandemic had curtailed what was possible, but it had also shown us unexpected paths and new ways of doing things. In the course of developing the exhibition, we also sought to include different ways that visitors might connect to the objects. This music book from Spain, massive in scale and so heavy that it requires four people to move safely, would have been used in performance. We wanted to open up that dimension of experience and so made available through QR code a recording of the hymn on the page created by our collaborators at Western University. In this way, visitors could look at the page and hear those same notes read, sung aloud. We also wanted to find other ways to give our visitors insight into the research work that went into our study of the objects beyond what we could transmit through the very limited word count of a display case's label. Our old books new science lab head of research, Dr. Jessica Lockhart, together with postdoctoral fellow Dr. James Sargon, took the lead in developing a pair of videos that would allow the visitor to look inside the closed book, seeing details of the sewing structure, the interior of the book's spine, and the concealed contents of its covers. This work would normally only be available in the rarefied environment of the university lab, but here we had an opportunity to share the excitement of discovery with a wider audience. And you can see that response here, watching the videos in the gallery. One video features BSR project leader Alexandra Gillespie, along with Phyllis and others, telling the story of how micro CT imaging can reveal the hidden stories of the book. The other video dives deeper, showing regular video images of four selected objects in the show, each one followed by a micro CT scan of the same object. The videos shown in the exhibition are also available in longer format with narration on the digital companion to the Hidden Stories exhibition. I won't describe our website, which is hosted by the University of Toronto Libraries in any detail, but I'll just encourage you to visit it and to say a few words about its purpose. From our first days planning the in-person exhibition, we knew that the future was unpredictable. Would we be able to open on time? 
Would the museum stay open or would we be forced to close due to public health measures? How could we prepare for every contingency? In other words, we developed an acute plan A, plan B mentality. We decided that the website should truly be a companion, not a competitor. And so it would include only the backbone, only the essential objects from the Hidden Story show, along with some educational resources at the time of the exhibition's opening in October. As the months went on, however, we continually added to the site with regular updates. Another one is scheduled for this coming weekend and additions. Once the Matterport virtual tour was prepared, we added this to the, to the Hidden Stories digital site, ensuring that our online companion would provide multiple alternative paths into the global history of the book. Unlike the in-person exhibition, which is necessarily limited to several months, the virtual exhibit will be updated and maintained for at least three years. And we hope to keep the educational resources available longer than that if possible and if people want them. So far, I've been looking backward at the path that brought us to where we are today. I'd like to now look forward toward the possible futures opened up by the exhibition. It's crucial to notice the timing of this symposium. Early on, we decided that instead of having a conference to mark the exhibition's opening, we wanted instead to hold one to mark the close. We did this in order to use the symposium as a kind of a doorway where we could look, Janice faced, both back at what we had done and ahead toward future ventures. We knew that this would be an opportunity to highlight the contributions of the research team that contributed to this project especially early career researchers, including graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. We wanted also to acknowledge the many con contributions of the curators at the institutions who loaned items for the Hidden Stories exhibition, who are both generous and creative in helping to identify appropriate objects and to maximize their impact. Finally, we wanted both to celebrate what we had done well and to look harder at the things we might have done better, asking ourselves what we might have left out and what foundations we had laid that could now be built upon. The roundtables to come on Judaica, South and Southeast Asia, Ethiopia, and the Americas are designed in that spirit, aiming to deepen our understanding and ask better questions in the hope of working toward more complete and more generative answers in the future. I'll say a little bit more about those roundtables shortly. Now, though, I'd like to elaborate just a little bit on the single most important thing, in my view, that emerged from our work on hidden stories, that is the relationship of the local and the global. From the earliest planning stages, we were certain that we wanted to include a map. Now, this is nothing unusual in a museum exhibition. They often include a map to orient visitors and give them a sense of where the objects came from. For hidden stories, though, the map would be particularly important, not just because we were featuring objects from such a wide range of locations spread across Asia, Europe, and Africa, and beyond, but because the concept of movement was so crucial to our concept of the exhibition. As you can see on the map, we wanted to highlight not only the historical Silk Roads indicated here with green lines, but also the water routes that link the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf, to the Indian Ocean and beyond. Early on, we considered adding lines to the floor of the gallery to guide our visitors through the space, enacting a kind of personal movement that would follow the trajectory of the Silk Roads. We gradually shifted to different strategies to create the sense of movement through space, including a particularly creative idea, which if I remember correctly, came from the exhibition's designer, Christine Elson, and educational consultant, Patricia Bentley. As you can see here on the wall, the map includes disc-shaped images taken from the objects in the show, which aren't labeled. Instead, to find the object in the gallery, you look at the color of the circle surrounding the disc, which leads you to the section of the show marked with that theme color. This playful strategy appealed to viewers, as you can see, giving them another way to engage with the gallery space. In some ways, the global perspective is a no-brainer. It's self-evidently valuable to take in a broader, more inclusive perspective on the past, not least because our modern world demands it. But how can we take a global perspective without flattening out difference, without sacrificing nuance and in-depth knowledge? This is a difficult question. In the book in the Silk Roads Research Project, we've approached this challenge by develop a, developing a complex and pliable network that brings in experts with different skill sets, philologists, codicologists, engineers, biochemists, curators, conservators, in a kind of circle encompassing the individual object, the single book. In this way, we're able to delve deeply into each tradition centered on one object or on a few related objects from a single historical and cultural context, foregrounding specialist knowledge. We're then able to cut across fields working comparatively across those clusters to produce a networked, integrated account of the pre-modern interconnected world. Our workshop last June on textiles and manuscripts exemplified this methodology of intense engagement with individual traditions, 
followed by cutting horizontally across specialist fields. This methodology builds on approaches that come from the field of Mediterranean studies, identifying zones of intensification and remission where cultural, social, and material interactions become more or less intense over time. Places like the Cairo Geniza or the Library Cave of Dunhuang have a special place in this approach to the past as surviving archives that mark particularly active crossroads in the history of human interactions, the transmission of ideas, and the sharing of craft practices. In this section of the map, we see the Mediterranean, noting both the intensive zones of exchange within the sea itself, but also the points of connection that link the Mediterranean to the Horn of Africa in the lower right part of the highlighted area, as well as beyond it, that is eastward toward the Indian Ocean. Some objects in the hidden stories show from the region highlighted here include this marriage contract or ketubah written in Hebrew from Greece and from the Horn of Africa, the healing scroll at right written in the Giz language. Moving eastward following sea routes of trade and exchange, we see South Asia and Central Asia. The land and sea routes that traverse this area marked in blue and green reveal a particularly complex network of exchange. Objects from this area include the Mughal painting of Alexander the Great in a tree pavilion at left, which Phyllis mentioned a little bit earlier, along with manuscripts at right from Nepal, Kashmir, and Myanmar. These objects are part of a regional history, or better, each sits at the center of its own local history. And also collectively, they're part of a global network of cultural and material exchange. Here, moving still further eastward, we see the part of the map that lies furthest to the east. And here we see objects that come from this region. You'll recall that the two pictured at left are objects I mentioned earlier when describing how the exhibition features paired objects that together produce a kind of harmony, even counterpoint. At upper left in the illuminated area, you can see the thousand year old printed image of Avalokiteshvara preserved at Dunhuang that is paired in the exhibition with Mishnah leaves from the Cairo Geniza. At lower right, Oh, sorry, uh, at the center, you can see the Quran anthology that appears in the exhibition paired with a beautifully illuminated Bible manuscript from medieval Spain. And at right, you can see how we extended our reach even a bit further, including a hand colored sheet from a Japanese printed book, following the path of the historical Silk Roads to encompass sea routes as well. Similarly, at the far left of the map, we included a single object from the Americas. You can see that at the extreme left. How can this be part of the story of the Silk Roads, you might ask? We wanted to illustrate, at least with a single, particularly powerful example, how far the craft practices that made up the pre-modern book extended, taking techniques that were widespread in the Mediterranean and Iberia to the so-called New World. There, the history of the book would itself be transformed by contact with the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Here at left, you can see that singular object from the Americas, a baptismal register produced in Mexico. In the middle, you see the Hebrew Bible from Toledo I mentioned earlier, paired in the exhibition with the Quran anthology from China that we just saw. And at right, you see the antiphoner or large scale music book, which we made literally sing in the exhibition through the magic of the QR code and our collaborators at Western. Through these regional maps, I've tried to give a little taste of the way the local functions within the global, with, it, with regions of connectivity, some more intense, some less so, participating in large scale, even global networks of exchange. But this is only one aspect of the relationship of the local and the global. In the Hidden Stories exhibition, we conceive of the relationship of the local and the global in two ways. First, in terms of the local and regional zones of connectivity in which each object is embedded, as I've tried to briefly illustrate today. And second, in terms of our own situatedness, the ways in which the place where we do our work and the layered history of this place inflects the nature of the work we do. On an institutional level, we can see this local quality in the partnership of the Southern Ontario institutions and private collectors that have participated in this exhibition. Here we see the Aga Khan Museum at the center, along with our partners, uh, the Royal Ontario Museum, the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, and Western University Library, as well as the Marilyn and Marshall Wolf Collection. We're telling a global story, but doing so through the lens of a local set of collections governed by the histories of collecting, including colonial histories that brought these objects to this place. When we tell a global story, we necessarily always do so in a local, situated way. This should be understood not only in terms of the repositories that hold the objects, but also in terms of the land that these institutions occupy. This includes a layered history of this land and a recognition of the languages traditionally spoken here, and above all, of the people who continue to maintain a relationship to this land, the original people. 
If we consider the relationship of the global and the local with regard to our Hidden Stories exhibition, we might want to base it on the land that the site of the in-person exhibition is on, that is the site of the Aga Khan Museum, or perhaps the land that the University of Toronto libraries are on, whose servers host the online version of the Hidden Stories exhibit. Or we might want to encompass the lands where the cultural heritage institutions that contribute to the show are situated. All of these, except for Western University, are governed by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed in 1923 with the Mississauga and Chippewa Bands. Western University sits on land connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796, signed with the Chippewa Nation. Or, bearing in mind that both the majority of the work of, on this exhibition and the very symposium that we're holding right now are being conducted online, we might want to consider the local situatedness that we each bring to this work, living, as I think many of us are, on stolen land. I'm speaking to you from Lenapoking, which is Lenape land um, affected by many treaties and land exchanges, but in particular the Walking Purchase of 1737 and the East Treaty of Easton of 1758. We might want to reflect on how the layered history of the land we inhabit necessarily inflects the global stories we tell. In thinking about what we've learned from the experience of developing and sharing the Hidden Stories exhibition, I've been asking myself how the global story of the pre-modern interconnected past might look different if you told it somewhere else. In other words, how does our local situatedness affect the global stories we tell? And as part of this thought experiment, I've been thinking a lot about the cloisters, which some of you know um, in New York. And I don't have time to tell the story, but I think that it's really neat to think about what, what we've done at the Khan Museum, how it looks from another place. And maybe that's something we'll end up talking about in the closing session of the, of the conference. In today's four roundtables, we'll hear panels of brilliant scholars bring their expertise to bear on the objects featured in the Hidden Stories exhibition, drawing in additional examples as needed to enlarge or enrich the specific context. Some of these scholars have long been involved with the Book in the Silk Roads project, while others have joined more recently, particularly for this symposium, perhaps to collaborate on future research projects. Maybe. Each of the roundtables has a few focus objects, points of reference that our panelists can use to round the discussion. The first roundtable focused on Judaica includes a leaf associated with the Kaifeng community in China, as well as the Toledo Bible from Spain, which we've seen, and the marriage contract of Ketubah from uh, Greece, which we've also seen. The second roundtable focused on South and Southeast Asia will refer to the book of Buddhist scriptures, Akamawasa from Myanmar, as well as the Sutra of the Five Protectresses from Nepal. Tomorrow's sessions will begin with a roundtable on Ethiopia, featuring as its reference objects a Quran manuscript and an amulet scroll, different in format, one a codex and the other a scroll, and also different in their religious orientation, one Muslim, one Christian, if perhaps slightly heterodox. Our final roundtable on the Americas is an outlier in two ways. First, in reaching across the Atlantic, far beyond the limits of the historical Silk Roads to Mexico. And second, in being focused on one highly potent object, a baptismal register used to note the births of indigenous children. Through this sequence of four roundtables, ending with a closing reflection by our colleague, Alexandra Gillespie, I expect us to come to a deeper understanding both of the specific objects gathered here in the Hidden Stories exhibition and of the global framework that we've placed them in. Before we take a five minute break and return for the first roundtable, let me make a few housekeeping announcements, which will outline the structure of the sessions. Each round table is two hours long, beginning with a brief introduction by the moderator, after which each presenter will speak for about maybe 10 or 12 minutes and in round tables with four presenters. The final round table is structured a little bit differently. Then the presenters will have about 15 minutes for discussion among themselves before we open up the conversation for the second hour to questions and comments from the audience. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank not only our session moderators, but also the chat moderators who will be assisting them in each session, reading the questions as they come through and passing them on to the session chair. These include Morgan Moore for the Judaica session, Sloan Geddes for the session on South and Southeast Asia, Sarah Ameri for the session on Ethiopia, and Alexandra Atia for the session on the Americas.